It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Early this morning, the Premier claimed that Toronto City Hall is dysfunctional and focused on the wrong priorities. Yet, under his leadership last night, Queen's Park was barricaded to the public, literally in the dead of night, to Order. ram through a bill that strips citizens of their charter rights, an issue that the Premier didn't mention once during the election campaign. Is that what functional looks like to this Premier? Uh, Through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank everyone for staying here last night. I want to thank the NDP, the Liberals, the Green, and especially our party. Leader of the Opposition, you're accusing me of doing things, but you weren't even here last night. <laughs> While you were sleeping, your team was fighting for— The Premier will take a seat. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's not helpful or appropriate to make reference to the absence of any members. The Premier. Draw. We were here last night, like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people around this province. The police officers that have to work at night, the nurses that have to work at night, factory workers that have to work at night. I don't know what we were making such a big deal about, because we actually had to work at night. No different than anyone else. We were fighting for the taxpayers of this great city as we were working tens of thousands of people across this city. Stop the clock. Time's up. Time's up. Start the clock. No, time's up. Supplementary. This Premier never disappoints with his pettiness. <laughs> the people who filled the gallery last night are concerned citizens. The Premier may want to ignore them, but unlike the professional actors that he hired to cheer him, up, to cheer him during the campaign, these folks are not going away, and they're not alone. Last week in question period, the Premier said that former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien agreed with his plan to override charter rights. Has the Premier been updated lately on what the former Prime Minister actually thinks? Premier. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker, we are here to make sure that, as I've said over and over again, we're here to get this city moving, we're here to build transit, to get people from home to work, believe it or not, sooner than three hours. It takes people sometimes three and four hours to get back and forth to work because we don't have any transit. The infrastructure is cr just crumbling underneath our feet, and we all know about the housing crisis. We have a major housing crisis, and we're going to make sure that we fix the transit that we fix the housing crisis and we start getting infrastructure going. My friends, if we have to work every single night for the next four years, that's exactly what we'll do to turn this off. Start the clock. Final supplementary. I was asking. It seems like the Premier got a bad briefing last week because this is what Prime Minister, Kretch, or Prime Minister Kretchen and others wrote this week. Quote, we condemn Premier Ford's actions and call on those in his cabinet and caucus to stand up to him. The statement wasn't just signed by Prime Minister Chrétien. It was also signed by Roy McMurtry, the Progressive Conservative Attorney General who helped frame the Charter. He's joining other prominent Progressive Conservatives, wondering what has happened to their party. And thousands of Ontarians who think the Charter is more important than the Premier's fixation on the City of Toronto. Does the Premier think that every one of these people are simply wrong and that he and he alone is right? That's right. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, it's very clear in the Constitution. It's very clear that we were able to use it, we have the right to use it, and we will use it. My friends, my friends, I can tell you this is about protecting, this is about protecting 
the people of Toronto. It's not about protecting the downtown NDP. I have never yeah. seen a group of people waste so much energy on protecting politicians' jobs than each and every one of you. I just wish once, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition would come in with some cost savings, with some ideas to save the taxpayers' money, rather than always thinking about, just, just think, God forbid the Leader of the Opposition actually won, there'd be 4,500 people out of work right now in Pickering. They'd be looking for jobs. We'd be paying close to $2 a litre for gasoline. Our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks, Speaker. The next question is also for the Premier, the Premier who lost 81,000 jobs in August in Ontario. Right. Ontario families have, um, have a lot of urgent business for the government. They're sending their kids to school that have lead, schools that have lead in the drinking water. They've crammed they're crammed in hospital Order. hallways waiting for treatment. As I said, 80,000 of them lost a job last month. They're looking to Queen's Park for action, Speaker. Instead, they see a Premier who has dropped everything to focus on the size of Toronto City Council, even though seniors, senior figures in his own party tell him he's wrong, even though he has to barricade himself inside this legislature in the dead of night, even though it means overriding the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. What does this Premier say? to families who have different priorities. Premier. Oh, oh <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker, that's pretty rich. Uh, yes. that's that okay. is pretty rich coming from the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker. The same Leader of the Opposition that propped up the Liberals 97% yep. of the time, propped them up on all the scandals, prop them up on raising the hydro rates, prop them up on raising taxes. You were side by side, shoulder to shoulder, with the most politically corrupt government in the history of Ontario. Supplementary. Speaker, the uh, people of this province need good jobs. Instead, they get the Premier's grudges with Toronto City Councillors. The people of this province need good schools where their children can drink the water. Instead, they have a provincial government obsessing about one municipal election. The people of this province need shorter wait times in hospitals. Instead, they get a government that's taking away their rights literally in the middle of the night. The people of this province need a government that makes their family a priority. Instead, they have the Premier who makes himself a priority. When is this Premier going to get his priorities straight? Premier. Okay. We're making sure we're getting the priorities right through you, Mr. Speaker. This government here, the PC government, no one in the country has ever moved quicker for the here taxpayers yep. than this government right here. The Leader of the Opposition could look at our top 20, our top 20 that we're already saving hundreds of millions of dollars for the taxpayers, no matter if it's getting rid of the wind turbines, over 700 turbines are gone, over $700 million is saved yes. back into the taxpayer's yep. pocket, no matter if it's challenging the federal government on the carbon tax, the worst tax anyone could ever see. My friends, we're going to continue working hard for the taxpayers. We're going to get work hard for the people of Toronto, the economic engine of Ontario. We will create jobs. We won't be losing 300,000 jobs like the previous government. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. You know, Speaker, usually it takes years for governments to lose touch and wear out their welcome with the people who elected them. Right. I can remember the backbench uh, government members who were here a few short months ago on this side, who ignored their or on that side rather, who ignored their constituents and followed a premier who had lost touch with people's priorities. The premier bragged last night that skeptics, skeptics doubted that he could pass this bill. No one ever said the premier couldn't get this bill passed. Thousands and thousands of Ontario think he shouldn't get that's this right. bill passed. They want a government that's fixing schools, cutting wait times and creating jobs, not a premier locked in the legislature in the middle of the night, railing against old enemies at his old job. Does this premier understand the difference, Speaker? Premier. 
through you, Mr. Speaker. Again, the leader of the opposition was pretending she was here. It must have been in her dreams. Because she, when I was speaking, the leader of the opposition. Once again, it's inappropriate and unhelpful to make reference to the app. At any given time, a member might be absent. Any of us might be absent for a good reason, so that's why we don't do it. Premier, response. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, through you, again, this government in here is to make changes. It's about, as I said last night, it's about empowering the people instead of the government. It's about putting money back into the people's pocket instead of the government's pocket. It's about reducing the size and cost of government. People are just tapped out in this province. They can't afford any more taxes. We can't make sure, we have to make sure that every single area that the previous government implemented to raise the taxes no matter if it's your license fee, even $7, as the finance minister said last night, $7 may not Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the Deputy Premier. Coincidentally, the person who had the most votes during the Conservative leadership and the most riding support. The Premier uh, has indicated that he would, quote, not be shy about overriding the Charter again in order to get what he wants. The Deputy Premier stated last week that she was confident that any future attacks on Charter rights would be discussed at the Cabinet table. Can the Deputy Premier give us some sense of what her no-go areas will be when it comes to overriding Charter rights again? Deputy Premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Order. Speaker. Through you, thank you to the member for the question. This was a historic uh, morning. The member for Hamilton West, and Castor Dundas, will withdraw. I will withdraw. And again, I remind the members, uh, ministers have the right to uh, refer a question if they choose to do so. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing can reply. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Speaker, uh, the reason we recall the legislature on Saturday, the reason we were here this morning and have already had six and a half hours of debate on Bill 31 is because time is of the essence. We have an election on October 22nd, and in order to preserve that election, in order to ensure that that streamlined Toronto Council is available to make those important decisions exactly. upon their election, that's why we're here. We need to have Bill 31, the Efficient Local Government Act, passed. We're asking if the opposition really, truly wants to build transit, if they really, truly want to build infrastructure, then Spons. they should be supporting our bill, because that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to have that streamlined council. I, again, ask the opposition to support. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, back to the Deputy Premier. You know, people are justifiably confused as to where the Deputy Premier stands on all of this. She hinted that she might be willing to stand up to the Premier the next time he tries to trample Ontarians' charter rights, but this time she's effectively silent. Even as progressive Conservative giants like Bill Davis, Brian Mulroney, uh, Roy McMurtry and Peter McKay stepped forward to say that the Premier is wrong. McMurtry even urged the Cabinet and caucus to stand up to Premier Ford. And I quote, History will judge them by their silence. If the Deputy Premier won't stand up for the Charter now, why should anybody believe that she will any time in the future? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I'll tell you something. The Premier wasn't silent during the election. Every day during the election, he talked about reducing the size and cost of government. He talked about respecting the taxpayers' dollar. You know, they come to order. Want, Speaker, but the people sent us here to get things done, and that's exactly what we're doing. Speaker. Next question, member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Through you, my question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. In the past couple of months, we've seen many flip-flops with the federal government 
and their climate change plan. We've seen them climb down over their carbon pricing guidelines, and just three weeks ago, NDP Premier Rachel Notley pulled Alberta out of the federal climate plan, citing the federal government's inability to get their natural resources to market. She expressed feelings of anger and disappointment with the federal government having let them down. Last Friday, our minister provided an update to the people of Ontario with a very important step forward taken by our government against the federal government's attempt to impose a carbon tax on the people of Ontario. Can the minister, through you, Speaker, can the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, explain to the House what progress has been made? Good question. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member from uh, Bruce Gray for his uh, hard work on behalf of his constituents and on all of us last, for all of us last night was, uh, was well noted. Uh, Mr. Speaker, during the election, our plan was clear, and a cornerstone of that plan was to make sure that we repealed the job-killing regressive cap-and-trade program of the previous government, <laughs> and that, if necessary, we would fight the imposition of the Liberal carbon tax on the people of Ontario all the way to the Supreme Court. Yep. Last week, our government issued what's called a Statement of Particulars with the Ontario Court of Appeals. It lays out the next steps in that fight to ensure that Ontario families are not penalized or not punished by the Liberal tax. Mr. Speaker, this statement outlines the reasons why our position on the carbon tax is that it is unconstitutional, and our government will put the people first and stand against any carbon tax from the federal Liberals. Here, here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for his answer, and back to the Minister of the Environment. It's clear that this government has the best interests of Ontarians' families at heart. It is also clear that this government has done more and kept more promises in the first four months than the previous government had in the last four years. This is a government that keeps the promises it makes to the people of Ontario. Speaker, the language from the federal government is concerning. They have been clear that they believe the only solution to climate change is a tax. Sounds a bit like the NDP. Yeah. We have been equally clear that we reject that notion. Speaker, as Bill 4 would rid the province of the Liberals' cap-and-trade scheme, we will need a plan to address the challenges that climate change presents to our future generations. Can the minister advise this House as to what the government's plans are to address, to address climate change in Ontario? Here, here. Response. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. Ontario has made significant progress in climate change. Total greenhouse gas emissions have been reduced by 22 per cent since 2005. This achievement has been, come at a cost to Ontarians. Ontarians have done a great deal, but Ontario can and will do more. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the challenge that climate change faces, and we will do our part. That's why we consulted with the people of Ontario through the campaign, and our first step was Bill 4 to withdraw the failed cap-and-trade program of the previous Promise government. Promise cap. We're now working on a Made in Ontario plan, a plan that will balance taxpayers' interests with the interests of the environment and prepare Ontario for the climate change that is happening. Our Ontario Made plan will build on the results we've achieved, balance the economy and the environment, and not penalize Ontario families. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. By convention, the notwithstanding clause is reserved for extraordinary circumstances only. Employing it to meddle in Toronto's municipal elections is a frivolous use of a tool that is meant to be used with great caution. And many are concerned that the use of this controversial loophole is a troubling sign of what's to come. Speaker, using the notwithstanding clause in this instance sets a frighteningly low bar for violating our constitutional rights in the future. If the government is willing to use it to attack Toronto now, where will the Attorney General draw the line? The Attorney General. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there is wide consensus that Section 33, as conceived by those who wrote and approved it, said that it was to be a tool that balanced the role of the courts and the role of the legislature. Alan Blakeney, the former NDP Premier of Saskatchewan, at the First Minister's Conference on the Constitution in November of 1981, said that Section 33 is, and I quote, fully consistent with the sort of argument that we have put forward, 
that we need to have balance between the protection of rights with the existence of our institutions, which have served us so well for so many centuries. Mr. Speaker, we have been clear that we are invoking Section 33 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because time is of the essence. The election is on October 22nd, and the voters of Toronto need certainty. And that is Members will take their seats. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And while I can appreciate the comments made by the Attorney General, this weekend 400 legal professionals in Ontario signed an open letter to our Attorney General urging her to vote against the use of the notwithstanding clause. The letter says, and I quote, the government is beholden to the highest law in the land, which is the Constitution. We expect the Attorney General to value the role of the judiciary and the important check that the courts have on the impulses of the government. End quote. Does the Attorney General believe the judiciary has a responsibility to act as a check on our government? Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for her question, and I, she references the highest law in our land. Section 33 of the Charter, which is part of the highest law of our land, confirms the paramountcy of legislatures to decide matters within their area of jurisdiction. It is a tool, Mr. Speaker, that recognizes the long-standing that principle that Canada is a parliamentary democracy. The purpose the of Section 33 is to provide a mechanism so that where there is a disagreement between a judge and the legislature surrounding the constitutionality of a law, that the people get the final say, Mr. Speaker. As with all exercises Order. of parliamentary power, the ramifications of our decisions will occur at the ballot box. Thank you, Order. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. The summer season is winding down for tourism operators across the province. In my riding of Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill and the town of Aurora and Richmond Hill, people, co people come from near and far to enjoy attractions such as the Great Moraine, the Lake, Lake Wilcox and the David Dun Dunlop Observatory, among other great attractions. Can the minister tell us about how tourism is important to Ontario's economy and to creating good jobs right here in Ontario? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Good to see you again, Speaker. Um, the uh, member from Oak Ridges, Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill is absolutely right. Tourism is an important part of Ontario's economy. In fact, the tourism sector generates over 390,000 jobs wow. and generates $34.1 billion in economic activity. Our ministry will work with tourism industry to maximize growth and investment and send a message that Ontario is open for business. Our government is committed to diversifying and strengthening tourism from the north to the south to the east to the west. As the honourable member knows, we have ambitious plans for Ontario's economy, and I'd love to expand on that in your supplementary. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for that very insightful answer. It reminds me of how vital tourism is to our province. I'm glad to see the mantra of being open for business extends to our tourism partners as well. Can the minister elaborate on how our government for the people supports tourism operators, along with all the great festivals and events that bring people from all over the world to our great province of Ontario? Minister. And thank you for the question. Under our government, the tourism industry will grow, and we're going to rely on experts, tourism operators, to help us do that. Government can't create jobs on our own, but we can create conditions that make it easier to start a business, grow a business, or invest in Ontario. That's why we will continue to lower hydro rates and business taxes, and it's why we will cut red tape for businesses. We also provide support for festivals and events through programs like Festival Ontario or the Ontario Trillium Grants. Our ministry and tourism partners across Ontario share a collaborative approach that maximizes resources and encourages strategic planning and investment to further grow tourism and jobs across Ontario. Economic modeling proves that for every dollar Response. provincial and 
provincial investment results in almost $21 of visitor spending. We are going to ensure value for money in our tourism investments and ensure that Ontario is open for business. Thank you. Next question, the member for University, Rosedale. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Can the Premier explain the consultation process for Bill 5? Premier. Yeah. We, through you, Mr. Speaker, we had the longest consultation ever. When we crisscrossed the province and we talked to people about reducing the size of government, I came to Toronto and talked to the people from Etobicoke to Scarborough to North York, East York, and downtown. I heard the same sentiment, and the sentiment was, this government is dysfunctional at City Hall. It gets nothing done. We couldn't build transit in the last 20 years. We have a housing crisis. We, had a, we have a crumpling infrastructure. That's what I heard when I talked to the people of Toronto. They're fed up. They're fed up with the dysfunction at City Hall. They want less politicians. Matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, I never heard one person come up to me Bonds. and say, Doug, we need more politicians. We want larger bureaucracy. But I can tell you one thing. There was no consultation when they went. For Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Premier. New Democrats just received a Freedom of Information request from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. We asked the Ministry for records on the consultations for Bill 5, as well as the instructions that were given to the Ministry for drafting the bill. The Ministry responded with, and I quote, after conducting a thorough search to the Ministry files, no records were located responsive to your request. Oh. No records were located responsive to your request. Speaker, can the Premier tell the House who he cut a backroom deal with to rip up Toronto's wards in the middle of an election? Yes. Premier. Talk to the people who doesn't write through, letters. Through you, Mr. Speaker, the people of Toronto do not want to see another four years of dysfunction, four years of not building transit, four years of raising taxes. That's what people are fed up with. People want to see transit built, infrastructure built, and housing built. And I can tell you, it doesn't take 47 people to do that. It takes 25 councillors to do that. And you know who's going to be happier than anyone, Mr. Speaker? The mayor. The mayor is going to be happier than anyone because he, he's not going to have to work 47 people. They're going to get things done. As I've said over and over again, good governance is seven to nine people on a board. People want less politicians. They don't Bonds. want more politicians. In the next election, I'll be more than happy to run on less politicians. And Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Guelph. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Early this morning during debate on Bill 31, the Premier said that he wanted to reduce the power of government. But Bill 31 does exactly the opposite. It places an unprecedented amount of power in the government's hands. Invoking the notwithstanding clause is the government using big power to suspend people's charter rights. So how can the Premier say he is reducing power when he is using the heavy hand of government power to suspend people's charter rights? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, there won't be any rights taken away. It's going to be very clear. Every person in Toronto will be able to elect their elected councillor. Every single person in Toronto should be able to pick up the phone when they have an issue and call their councillor. And every councillor should go to their door and answer their, their request. 
My friends, I did it for four years, and I took care of more than one ward. I took care of a dozen wards. Because you know why I took care of a dozen wards? Because the existing councillors were ignoring the phone calls. They weren't calling people back. And through you, Mr. Speaker, I still take municipal calls every single day on transit, on housing, on infrastructure. Because, because the average constituent needs help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, through you back to the Premier. Invoking the notwithstanding clause, the very definition of that is suspending people's charter rights. That is a huge, big power grab. That's exactly why people like former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney said, I don't like the notwithstanding clause. It's exactly why former Progressive Conservative Premier Bill Davis has condemned the Premier's use of the notwithstanding clause. Using big government power to change the rules in the middle of an election campaign has never happened in Canadian history. Mr. Speaker, the legal costs are mounting. How many taxpayer dollars is the Premier prepared to waste on his scheme to interfere in local Toronto elections? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and to my friend and member from Guelph, we should start focusing on jobs. I'll have to tell you a quick story. We had a company come to us, a, Chinese, a company from China that wants to employ 400 people in window manufacture, and guess what, Mr. Speaker? They wanted to go to Guelph, but Guelph refused them. Who refuses 400 jobs? I just I don't understand it, but I'm sure there's jurisdictions all around Ontario that would love a glass company to come to their riding. Come to Etobicoke, come to Scarborough, come to any of our MPPs areas. They'd be happy to take 400 jobs, but the member from Guelph didn't want the 400 jobs over there. He'd rather come down here and argue. Order. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Over the weekend, our government was hard at work for the people, moving forward with the efficient Local Government Act. The NDP loves big government and is using every delay tactic that they can to save politicians' jobs. But we know Toronto needs an efficient and effective council that can make important decisions faster. In leading off the debate, Minister, you mentioned the number of former premiers who support us using the legal tools in the Constitution, like Bill 31, has in, is, and we want to make sure that it is passed in time for the upcoming municipal election. Can you tell us more about the Premier's support? Yeah. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Eglinton Lawrence for that, uh, that question. You are absolutely right. Three former uh, Premiers, Christy Clark from uh, British Columbia, Brad Wall from Saskatchewan and Jean Charest from Quebec have all come out uh, supporting us on the use of Section 33 of the Charter. They were on a CBC panel show uh, last week talking about it. Former Premier Clark stated, and I quote, I actually think it's a good thing for Canada because we are in a moment where Canadians are looking around and saying, hey, why can't anything get done? While Premier Ford has shown there is a way to find a way to get things done. Speaker, Christy Clark is right. That's exactly what our government is doing. We're here today. We were here at midnight to get things done. And that's something that actually the City Council in Toronto can do once Bill 31 is passed. So that's why we're here, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you for that answer, Minister. It's important for the people of Ontario to know that those former premiers who have had to make tough decisions themselves support what we're doing. 
the angry NDP and their leader can continue to shout Order. and personally insult our members, as they do every day. But that is not going to keep us from doing the jobs that we were elected to do. We talked every day during the campaign about reducing the size and cost of government, and 2.3 million Ontarians gave us a mandate to do that. Can the minister explain why the Efficient Local Government Position Act to order. is a priority? Hey, hey, hey. Yes, Thanks, uh, thanks again, Speaker, and through you to the member. Bill 31 is important for Torontonians because it's time to end the political gridlock and dysfunction at City Hall. But it's bigger than that. When decisions are delayed by endless debate, transit and infrastructure projects aren't being built. People and goods can't get to where they need to because the gridlock at City Hall creates gridlock on our roads. That hurts Ontario's economy, which makes it everyone's concern. The opposition claims housing and transit are priorities for them, and if that's true, they'd support our legislation because we won't see shovels in the ground without a streamlined, effective council that will make those projects happen. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Ever since the Premier decided to disrupt local democracy in Toronto, other municipalities have wondered if they're next. But the government can't keep its story straight. At AMO last month, the Premier said he was only interested in Toronto. But last week, he said he was getting endless calls to cut Ottawa's council. The member for Nepean said the Premier didn't mean it. But then the member for Niagara West told the St. Catharines Standard that the Premier may now be targeting Niagara Region and other regional yeah. councils. So, Speaker, to the wow. Minister, who should we believe? Yeah. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And through you to the member, I, I want to thank you for actually being able to place a question uh, on the floor today without having to withdraw a de derogatory comment. Like every other question you've given me. Our government was, was very clear in AMO. Our Premier made his comments very known. I made my comments very known. Listen, our government at that conference, we set a record with 548 consultation meetings with municipalities. Our government made it very clear. Directly, we want to hear from them about how we can make government work more effective and more efficient. Listen, we, we were very, very clear in our conversation with them. We wanted to make sure that they felt free to give us ideas about in terms of regional government, what worked and what didn't work. And we're going to continue to have that dialogue. It was a great start at that AMO conference. But again, I'm just a little concerned with this member and how he. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier didn't run on cutting Toronto City Council. Everyone knows it. During the election, there was not a single word from any member of the government on their plans to meddle in local democracy. Now we're getting conflicting information as to whether or not more municipalities will be subject to attacks like Toronto. Will the minister be honest with the people of Ontario and tell the House if the government will be cutting the size of City Council for other municipalities or regional governments, yes or no? Minister. Speaker, through you to the member. Read Bill 31. It deals with Toronto City Council. Read the Premier's speech at AMO. He was very clear Crystal about clear. why and what this bill is about and what the previous Bill 5 was about. Yes, we asked municipalities if they have ideas on how they can run better. And we received lots of ideas. We received ideas on how we can reduce their regulatory burden. We had ideas on how we can speed up the development process so that we can actually get some affordable housing to market faster. We engaged our municipal partners. And I, I want to take this opportunity to thank my two parliamentary assistants, Jim Mackinac and Christine Hogarth, for the money they have in the This government wants to hear from Ontario's 444 Response. On how we can deliver those critical services better to our taxpayers. The member should read some of those speeches. Thank you. Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. 
I was so proud to be here this morning with my colleagues to work hard to bring Ontario back on track. Earlier this morning, the Honourable Minister of Finance delivered a rousing speech in which, in which he encouraged all members to fill out the Planning for Prosperity online consultation survey. The Minister of Finance said, Bring the ideas to help return prosperity to Ontario. Don't fight these ideas. Join us. It is the responsibility of all of us in this House to be stewards of public finances and to ensure that we leave a stable foundation for future generations to build upon and not a legacy of debt like that of the former government. Can the President of the Treasury Board please inform the House what the government is doing to ensure that Ontario continues to be prosperous now and into the future? President of the Treasury Board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Centre for that very excellent question. I, too, appreciated the comments this morning about our planning for prosperity consultations. Friday is the last day for submission, so I encourage everyone, regardless of party affiliation, to submit their comments. Working closely with my friend, the Minister of Finance, and with the full support of the Premier, I can assure this House that we are taking our responsibility for putting Ontario back on track seriously. Every action we take, every bill we make, has as a goal the difficult task of getting our province back on track and repairing 15 years of financial Position come to order. As for the planning for prosperity consultations, together we can work towards a stronger, more prosperous Ontario. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, back to the President of the Treasury Board. The former government sold Ontario up the creek without a paddle. Through poor fiscal and program management, they let the people of Ontario down. The NDP, instead of opposing this recklessness, voted with the government 97 per cent of the time. The NDP enabled the recklessness of the previous government. As a result, Ontario spends more on interest payments on the provincial debt than it does on the entire Ontario Public Service or on all of post-secondary education and training. Quite simply, we are robbing future generations on interest payments alone and saddling them with a devastating burden of debt. Can the President of the Treasury Board please advise this House what the government is doing to get public spending back under control? President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for another well-informed question. Aside from the financial inquiry, the line-by-line -line audit of the public books, and a discretionary spending spree freeze, we also wanted to consult the people. That's why we launched the Planning for Prosperity consultation, which closes this Friday. I'm pleased to inform the House that the people continue to submit ideas, with almost 15,000 individual amazing. ideas submitted so far. Some, Mr. Speaker, I suspect from the other side of the House. The people of Ontario have called for a government that listens, and we have answered that call. To all those people out there struggling to make ends meet, to all the business owners who are suffering, to all the families that have expenses ever climbing, I say this. Bonds. We are listening, and help is on the way. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community, Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, does the minister believe racism exists in Ontario? And if so, does the minister believe addressing racism in all of its forms is a lower priority than forcing through Bill 31? Minister of Community, Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you for that question. First of all, We've made it very clear that there is no place in the province of Ontario for racism. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, consider, we consider ourselves to be an inclusive province, and we respect everyone. I want to assure the House as well that the Anti-Racism Directorate is continuing to fulfill its mandate on a whole-of-government approach to address both system, systemic racism by implementing a strategic plan. 
we will continue to work as a ministry and through the director to ensure that racism is not something that continues in the province or is in the province of Ontario. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister. I'm just a little concerned about the actual actions. Yeah. One of the very first things this Conservative government did was quietly collapse the anti-racism directorates, downgrade its minister to a part-time minister, and disband its subcommittees. The anti-racism directorate played a crucial role in fighting back against racism in Ontario, and unfortunately, it seems that this is not a priority for the minister. In fact, it is so low on the list that we're using our time and resources to debate a bill that violates Ontarians' rights and freedoms rather than than tackling urgent life and death issues like racism. So again, why is forcing through the Premier's charter bashing Bill 31 more of an urgent priority for the minister than taking action against racism in Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. I assure you, from the day I took over this portfolio and I started working, I have been working diligently in every aspect of the portfolio, from policing, to corrections, to the anti-racism directorate. And I will continue to work and to bring forward the issues that relate to this portfolio. We are working on a whole-of-government approach, as I mentioned. We are implementing an anti-racism data standard, and we are collecting and analyzing reliable and usable data that will help the government, that will help the government identify any systemic barriers across sectors and help make evidence-based decisions to shape policies, programs, and Spons. services, ultimately improving how the people of Ontario are served. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Our government for the people was elected on the promise of making Ontario open for business, to create and protect jobs, and we are committed to sending that message to the world. The private sector has made it clear that after a decade of failed Liberal policies, it has become too difficult to open and to operate a business in Ontario. Could the minister please inform the legislature of his recent efforts to consult with Ontario businesses on reducing red tape? Good Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, I thank the uh, my honourable colleague uh, for the question. And I just want to report to uh, to the House that last week my parliamentary assistant Michael Parsa and I co-hosted red tape reduction roundtables in Barrie, Simcoe, Toronto, and Newmarket. And PA Parsa also went on to chair roundtables in Peterborough, Richmond Hill, Durham, and Ottawa. A very busy parliamentary assistant, Mr. Speaker, and an excellent parliamentary assistant. These uh, roundtables uh, mark the uh, beginning of our province-wide consultations to hear from business owners, the ones on the front line who feel the impact of excessive regulations, red tape, and liberal mismanagement of the past. Throughout the campaign and in our consultations, we've heard there's a lot that can be done to streamline regulations without compromising health or safety. For example, Mr. Speaker, we heard from one business owner Response. who has moved his business from Ontario, manufacturing business to the U.S., saying it was like going from a torture chamber to a candy store, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> That's just Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. We start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. It is reassuring to hear that our government, for the people, is committed wholeheartedly to ensuring that Ontario is open for business again. Too many Ontario um, employers have left, or they are threatening to leave our province because of the policies of the previous Liberal government. This was a government who imposed unnecessary costs on businesses and stifled growth. Business resources should be spent on improving and innovating, not on clearing regu regulatory hurdles. Could the minister please further explain the necessity to act boldly to ensure that Ontario is once again the economic engine of Canada? Minister. Thank you again to, uh, to my colleague for the question. Certainly the time for correcting Ontario's economic direction is now. The number of regulations in Ontario has grown to over 
380,000 regulations, Mr. Speaker. Regulatory burdens unheard of in anywhere else in the Western world. 380,000. British Columbia, by comparison, has just over 200. Thousand, and no one thinks BC is a terrible place to, to live, work, and raise a family. Speaker, we want to be the leader in Canada once again and the leader in the world, and we want to take the guesswork and gray areas for our businesses away by simplifying the regulatory process. We will cut taxes, as the Premier says, reduce red tape, and let the world know that Ontario is open for business, Mr. Speaker. We can do it, we will do it, and I encourage all members to get out there, hold your own red tape roundtables, and you'll see how bad it is and what a mess. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Order. All right, the clock. Next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Last week, the Minister penned an op-ed boasting of a government's plan to freeze the minimum wage at $14 an hour and remove $2,000 a year out of the hands of the lowest wage workers in the province. Does the Minister believe that violating the rights and freedoms of Ontarians by forcing through Bill 31 is more important than listening to Ontario's workers? and securing a fair living wage and better working conditions? Minister of Labour. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and thank the member opposite for the question. Yes, our government made a commitment to keep the minimum wage at $14 an hour. I and, and the, my caucus member believe in good paying jobs and opportunity for all Ontarians. So raising the minimum wage did not do what it was supposed to do. On January 1st, uh, 2018, Ontario's general minimum wage for most workers jumped from $11.60 to $14 an hour. The sudden 20 per cent increase in the minimum wage hasn't helped our economy, and an additional increase to 15 will not help it either. Since the rise of the minimum wage last year, Ontario has lost tens of thousands of jobs. In August, Ontario lost over 80,000 jobs, our largest monthly job loss in a decade. Every one of those jobs was part-time. So we need to give employers Bonds. time to adjust to the new minimum wage, which is why we promised to keep the minimum wage at $14 an hour. Supplementary. Uh, back to the minister. Uh, we could be here to take action on increasing minimum wage or creating better working conditions for Ontario's workers. And instead, we're here once again using our time and resources to debate a bill that violates Ontario's rights and freedoms. Speaker, why is focusing on Toronto City Council a more urgent priority for the minister than taking action on labour issues for workers across the province? Minister. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks to thank, uh, the minister. I want to thank the member for the question. Again, why, why did we recall the legislature on Saturday? Why did we meet from, uh, from midnight to uh, 7 a.m. this morning? Because we, we are committed to having an efficient and effective council at Toronto City Hall. We want those priorities. Listen, during that election, we talked to people every day about reducing the, so the size and cost of government. And, and, the, and Ontarians let us know that they wanted a government that gets things done. That's what we're doing here, Speaker. There's very important priorities, and, and you know, perhaps the NDP uh, uh, don't share the same priorities that we have. I, I believe that uh, by having a streamlined council here, that will be better for decision making. We believe we're having a, a, a government Bonds. that uh, respects uh, taxpayers' dollars is a good thing. That's what Ontarians sent us, uh, and that's why we're here on this side of the house again. Um, you know, uh, the NDP uh, have uh, a bit of a challenge when it comes to. Uh, <laughs> Next question, member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Status of Women. We have a situation in September 2018 where members of the NDP and other members of civil society continue to ask questions like why our Attorney General is not taking her father's advice 
and why she's somehow silent and submissive in our PC caucus. In fact, we have a Toronto City Councillor tweeting out, Hey, Brian, call your daughter. Can the Minister of Status of Women please tell us why this type of rhetoric is so unacceptable in 2018? Great question. The Minister responsible for the status of women. I'd like to thank the member from Durham, Speaker, for that very important question. As somebody who just this past year won the Equal Voice National Award for Advancing Women in Politics with our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, I have not been more disappointed in the discourse against my colleague, my seatmate, my friend, our Attorney General, in the last two weeks from the left-wing politicians in the city of Toronto and across the aisle. On the weekend, I read an article where she was condemned effectively for not taking her husband's last name. Well, I haven't either, Speaker, and not once in 13 years has my last name become an article in the Toronto Star. But hers was, I thought that went the way of the dodo bird after Maureen McTeer didn't take Joe Spots. Clark's last name. But let me also be clear, not one member of this assembly whose father was a previous politician, whether it's the member from, from uh, Kitchener-Conestogo or the Premier or the Transportation Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the call. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, through you, I thank the minister for her important answer. We have an attorney general who is a talented, well-educated lawyer. Here, here. Founder of her own charity, a role model to so many young women. Mr. Speaker, we need to act in a way in this place that is respectful of women and their accomplishments. So many young women are looking to us, looking to us as an example. Can the minister tell us why we must condemn this divisive language and stand behind the strong women who are participating in our democracy? Government House Leader, come to order. Response. Minister. Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity to respond to that very important question. Many of us in this chamber has, have fought our entire careers to make sure women are equal in the workplace and women are part of our political discourse. And what I have seen over the past two weeks in the left wing media and by them, and by the way, the protesters that have shown up to target my colleague rather than the member of municipal affairs is shameful, it's disgraceful, Order. and it should not be tolerated. In fact, last night or this morning when I walked home to my apartment with my colleague, the Municipal Affairs and Housing Minister. I actually asked him if he felt she was being targeted as well, and he agreed, as does every member of this government. We stand with our Attorney General. She's strong, she's competent, she's effective, and she's the best Attorney General we've ever had. Question. The member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to direct my question. I'd like to direct my question towards the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. Toronto is in the midst of a housing crisis, which should, by all accounts, be at the top of this government's list of priorities. But shamefully, the minister and this government do not agree. We have never seen a housing crisis in Toronto the way that we have now. The wait list for Toronto community housing is more than 10 years, and in the case of my own family, my mom waited on that list for 15 years. Why does this minister believe that forcing through legislation that violates my constituents' rights to freedoms is a higher priority than taking action on the absolutely deplorable housing crisis that we are facing in Toronto and all across Ontario. 
Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank, uh, through you, I want to thank the member for the uh, question. Um, Speaker, housing is a very important issue in this, uh, in this city. I believe very strongly that one of the, uh, the best ways we can help tackle that problem is to have a streamlined council that on October 22nd can help work Absolutely. with our government yeah. on making those important decisions. Uh, I've, I've said very, uh, very many, I've said a lot of times in this House uh, our, uh, our feeling that uh, we need more supply. Uh, we need to get uh, housing, uh, the approvals process. We need to work with our municipal partners, our service managers, our Indigenous program administrators to see if we can get more supply faster into the market. That was one of my, uh, my key messages at the uh, Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference. I, I spoke to, uh, to Mayor Tory about Boss. this uh, very fact, uh, I think the very first day that I uh, became minister. And I'll continue to work with those municipalities and our program partners to get that done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, back to the Minister. The government has not called us here to discuss a solution on the housing crisis. The government is not committing funding for social housing repairs or to build the 65,000 units of affordable housing that this province desperately needs. Instead, we are here to fight tooth and nail for the preservation of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Speaker, this is unacceptable, and I can't express how disappointed I am with this government and its inaction on housing as a whole. Why is this minister ignoring Toronto's housing crisis in favour of trampling on the rights and freedoms of the residents of not only Toronto, but all of Ontario? Thank you. Sure. Speaker, with the October 22nd election fast approaching, we have to move quickly. That's why we recalled the legislature. That's why we've debated Bill 31 for over six and a half hours uh, this morning. Uh, we need to move this piece of legislation forward so that we can work with uh, the new council, the streamlined council, on some of those important issues. I, I would hope that uh, the member would understand how important it is to have that council in place, and, and time is of the essence. We, we need to move this bill forward through the legislative process. Yes, we had a bill, Bill 5, that was passed. Unfortunately, that uh, decision, which we're appealing and which we hope to have a stay, uh, is, is how we're dealing with the, the Bill 5 situation. But again. We have a responsibility to the people of Toronto to have a council that's ready to make those important decisions on housing or transit and infrastructure. That's exactly what we were elected to do, and that's exactly what we're here, doing. Here, here. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House is in. Is it, did it have a point of order? Okay. Okay, just a second. I, I'm going to clarify something. The Speaker can't read anybody's mind. So, if you have a point of order, I need you to stand up and audibly and loudly say point of order, and then you call my attention to it. I gather the member's a point of order. I recognize the member for Guelph on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that. I just want to be clear: the city of Guelph did not say no to the glass plant. It was actually Guelph. It was Guelph Aramosa Township, which is in another riding that's held by. Thank you. Yeah. It, it, it is not a, a point of order, perhaps a point of information. Once again, this House is in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>